Uh, last Tuesday morning, uh, uh, Oxford University Press sent me Chris's new manuscript and asked me uh, to blurb it. And then Tuesday uh, afternoon, uh, Tuesday night, I was holding a meeting of the 30 or so people who work on positive health. Chris is part of the steering committee of positive health. He was coming from Michigan uh, to be part of our group as one of the founders. He founded Positive Health, he founded Positive Psychology, he founded MAP, and a few other things. And on uh, Tuesday afternoon, around 3 o'clock, my secretary came in in tears um, and told me that Chris had died. Um, the first thing I thought of, I had to go right off and talk to the 30 positive psychologists. I was with uh, Rhonda Cornum, General Cornum, and Rhonda and I had been together uh, on the day that 22 SEALs were killed in the helicopter crash in Afghanistan. That was 10% 10 per, 10 of the SEAL force of SEAL Team 6. And we happened to be with the SEAL commanders that night. And Rhonda said, uh, uh, death is terrible, but they couldn't have died at a better time. They were healthy, they were doing something that they thought was enormously meaningful, they were at the height of their lives and careers when they went. Uh, when I told that to Mandy, she said, that's awfully cold comfort. Um, Rhonda officiates at funerals a lot. Uh, I don't. Jan? Jan? Jan does, she, she would know how to do this. I don't know how to do it. I asked Wraith what to do, and Wraith, Wraith my friend Wraith does this a lot, uh, and he said, well, you have to leaven it with humor. And uh, Chris was enormously funny, as you remember, uh, but I can't leaven it with his humor because he, uh, all of his great jokes were sotto voce, so he would always drop his voice. <laughs> Uh, for the punchline, and everyone would burst into laughter, and I could never hear any of his jokes. So, uh, 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 I'm I'm at a loss, Wraith. Uh, Are you doing fine? Oh, good. Thanks. Uh, help me if I don't get through this. Uh, there's been uh, something happened immediately thereafter, starting around 10 o'clock that evening. Uh, 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 well, most of you are on the net, uh, and I'm on a lot of listservs, and one of them is the experimental psychologists of the world, and uh, four of the great cognitive psychologists died this year, Bill Estes, George Miller, uh, Dick Neisser, and Ed Smith. And I watched and participated in what people wrote, and it was all, you know, what geniuses they were and what great contributions they made. Uh, I've never, and then when things start to come in for Chris, I've never seen a waterfall of love. Uh, it, it made what was said of these great giants uh, pale. And so what I want to do is just to read you a few things that other people wrote interspersed. I've now read Chris's new book. Uh, it's 100 essays on positive psychology. and. Uh, uh, so I'll intersperse some of what Chris said with what some of you said. Uh, and then I want to have a little bit of discussion about how, uh, what phoenix can come out of Chris's ashes. Uh, and then I might do something else. Uh, so Dan Bowling uh, wrote, uh, Chris Peterson, a noted University of Michigan psychology professor, died October 9th. The field of psychology over which he loomed is called positive psychology. It was informed of his passing with a short listserv message from the founder of the field, Martin Seligman, quote, my close friend and my closest colleague, Christopher Peterson, died today. Well, I got up at four this morning to just to quantify how close we were as colleagues. Uh, we wrote 50 articles together and, uh, and two books. Uh, stunned is too pedestrian a word to describe how I and hundreds of colleagues feel. The online outpouring of grief from the positive psychology community 
which includes many of Chris's former graduate students, is uh, overwhelming and ongoing. Mind you, academic message boards are not always the gentlest and mutually supportive of places, even ones with the word positive in the descriptor. But this time it is different, and there is remarkable consistency to the posted reminiscences. I've read about 350 of them now. Uh, warmth, humor, kindness, and humility are words used almost without fail in each post. Others would come to mind, rigorous researcher, critical thinker, influential writer, famed lecturer, but those take a back seat to the simple humanistic character traits that Chris possessed in abundance. When you first met Chris, warm and humanistic wouldn't, wouldn't be the first words that came to mind. Uh, a bear of a man. <laughs> now that's uh, Angela, Nansuk, Chris, me and Mike Matthews from West Point. Uh, bear of a man, shaggy-haired and bearded, relatively shy and quiet. He could be intimidating if you didn't know him. Although he won Michigan's top teaching award last year, he was not a particularly eloquent speaker, certainly not charismatic in a Tony Robbins sort of way. He liked his cigarettes and he'd drink a beer with you. His favorite post-class meal in Philadelphia was a cheesesteak at Oscars, a place that looks exactly like it sounds. He loved his parents and those close to him. I don't know if his parents have been told they're 96. He hated to travel. He would get away with the type of humor that would get most of us written up. In private, he was bemused by the fact that he'd become a celebrity in the scientific world after turning 50 and could actually get paid to speak if he chose. What was so special about Chris that prompted the emotional response from legions of fans and admirers was because, in his favorite saying, other people matter. And that is how he lived his life. When you were around Chris, you knew you mattered. That's what Dan said. Uh, and then essay 40, thank you, Dan. Uh, so there are a hundred of these essays. They're remarkable. Uh, essay 43, I'll just read you a little part of several of the essays, uh, is called Having a Friend and Being a Friend. And relevant to what Dan told us. Those with stronger social relationships assessed by both quantitative and qualitative indices had a 50% increased likelihood of survival. An important theme that I'm talking through this, that Chris was intensely interested in uh, mortality, survival, uh, and risk factors for premature death. Uh, this finding held across age, sex, initial health status, cause of death, and length of follow-up period. So it bears repeating that other people matter. And in this case, mattering shows up in terms of an increased lifespan. Here's a simple multiple choice test. What was your first reaction when you read about this finding, which is not only reliable but quite robust? A. I thought about how many friends I had and whether I had enough friends to make me live longer. <laughs> B, I thought about how many people for whom I was a friend and whether I had enough friends to help other people live longer. My immediate answer was A. I admit it, but as I thought further, I realized that B was a pretty good answer too and maybe a morally better one to boot. Note to students, sometimes your first reaction to a test question is not correct. <laughs> Positive psychology can be criticized as much too focused on the individual. Many of the findings in this field are presented to the general public in terms of how they can benefit the individual. In other words, your increased happiness, success, health, and longevity. But sometimes doing the right thing does not always benefit the individual. Nonetheless, remains the right thing. Uh, many of the um, outpourings were from people I had never met or communicated with. Uh, one was from someone named Rachel Harari. Any, anyone know her? No. Uh, 
Dear Dr. Seligman, on my computer desktop sits a folder that is entitled P.S. It contains articles by you and Christopher Peterson. Whenever I look through that folder, I get a warm feeling, and I'm reminded of a quote by C.S. Lewis on friendship. Friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what? You, you too. I thought I was the only one. I, I suppose that I've romanticized this, but I imagine there was a moment between you and Dr. Peterson when the two of you had that aha moment, when you realized how much you shared in your life view intellectually, but also in your pursuit of joyous and flourishing life lived well together. What I'm really trying to say is that I'm so sorry for your loss. I know there'll be much public grieving, but for you, for those ideas that you will long to discuss, for all the little things you will want to pick up the phone and share with your dear friend, like this letter, uh, for all of those moments, I am truly sorry. It was a lovely honor to be on the outside of your friendship and yet to experience so many blessings from the fruits of your commitment to one another. Uh, Chris's essay number 24 is called The Last Lecture. Uh, so you may know that Chris won the Golden Apple Award at the Uni University of Michigan, a student-initiated Best Teacher Award, and he gave something called the first lecture. And uh, this is his essay about uh, Randy Pausch's last lecture. How many of you have seen it or read it? Yeah. Uh, I watched his last lecture wearing many hats. As a teacher, I was inspired. As a lecturer, I was filled with admiration. As a human being, I was proud. Uh, watch it yourself. No summary I could offer would do it justice. However, I do want to make a few observations. A positive psychologists, including me, intone that there are multiple routes to happiness and fulfillment through pleasure, through engagement, and through meaning. And if so, then Randy Pausch scored the hat trick of happiness. He is wickedly funny, he loves his work, and he contributes mightily to the larger world. Other people matter to him, and he to them. When he received tenure at his university, he took his entire research team to Disney World to express his gratitude. One of his colleagues later asked him, how could you do that? He responded, how could I not? Adore is not here, but Adore wrote, Adore Dorayapa, I think I probably pronounced it wrong. Adore. Adore. Yeah, she was map five? Four. Four. Uh, this is from Chris's last post in Psychology Today. Quote, I thought of my own mortality. What would I leave behind? likely not a gilded statue that would survive for many centuries. Regardless, I did have the thought that whatever legacy I might leave, and however short or long it might last, I hope it would be one that included what I shared with other people, as well as what I uniquely contributed. It breaks, end, end quote. It breaks my heart to read his words and know that uh, I can't hear them in person anymore. Chris, you have profoundly touched the lives of so many people in your wonderful and awesome blend of wisdom, energy, humor, and love and care for others. We will miss you so much, but your legacy is so a part of our lives, hearts, and minds that I know you can uh, never really leave us. Uh, Chris's essay number 87, uh, and, and uh, the last few essays are uh, thinking about mortality. It's called Bucket Lists and Positive Psychology. Here are some of my thoughts about bucket lists, 
from the perspective of a positive psychologist. Bucket list is an attempt to make life memorable and is consistent with Danny Kahneman's peak end theory, which holds that what people remember from hedonic events are their peaks. No peaks, no memories, or at least not very crisp ones. Whether life is an event is an issue to which I'll return, but certainly bucket lists, if accomplished, set memories in place that structure life as remembered. A bucket list can also be an attempt to make life meaningful, depending, of course, on the specific terms. Many of the bucket lists I read contains items that struck me as narcissistic, e.g. get a tattoo, but some did not. These lists contained items that would connect people to something larger than themselves, typically other people and their welfare. Take the entire family on a cruise. Positive psychology research suggests that the latter items are more important for a fulfilled life. Regardless of their details, bucket lists embody what psychologists have learned about goal setting. I look at Carolyn. Uh, Goals can motivate us to accomplish things, but the most motivating goals are those that are hard and specific. Every bucket list I read on the internet contains rich details about difficult things. Goals need to be coupled with plans for achieving them, but the right sort of goals are the first critical step. Sometimes we do not know what is worth doing until we actually do it and reflect on it. A sole focus on a bucket list might lead us to overlook other activities that would be memorable or significant, perhaps more so than what we have thought years or even decades earlier. Remember George Bailey in the 1946 film, It's a Wonderful Life, who never achieved anything on his own bucket list, school, travel, but did when given the opportunity to reflect conclude that he had lived a worthwhile life. He never let his own wishes get in the way of other people, and that's why we still cherish this film 60 years later. In any event, a bucket list is not about dying, but about living. And my chief objection to the phrase is simply that it is misleading. I do not think that most people create such lists with their imminent death in mind. Consider this stringent criteria. If you knew with certainty that you would die tomorrow, what would you do today? Would you really choose to spend your last day getting a tattoo? <laughs> so I like the spirit of the bucket list, if not the exact phrase. I like exhilarating memories, but not to the exclusion of meaningful experience. And I like lofty goals if they do not obscure the rest of what matters. And then Jan Stanley wrote, uh, Chris, as others have pointed out, embodied positive psychology principles in so many ways, too many to note in this forum. I've chosen a few to share. Uh, embodying humility and gratitude. Chris often told the story of how Marty invited him to work on the VF classification system. Uh, I'll just tell you that story, you may not know it. Uh, uh, the Mayerson Foundation told me they were giving me a million dollars to develop a, uh, uh, the opposite of DSM, a classification of the sanities. So I immediately called Chris, and it, uh, I said to Chris, uh, and this is from here, uh, what are you doing with the rest of your life, Chris? <laughs> and he said, well, Marty, it's my 50th birthday today. What is it you want to do with me? It was his 50th birthday 12 years ago. Um, uh, Chris said, yes, and that's how uh, virtue, the classification of virtue and strengths and via started. He came to Penn, he left his job at Michigan, took a three-year sabbatical, came to Penn for three years. Continuing Jan, embodying ikigai, we have it right, Kalori? A Korean phrase, isn't it Japanese? Japanese phrase, explained by Chris as meaning and purpose with passion underpinning. Now, I understand it as something that makes life worth living. What's, what's the closest to this? No, no, that's okay. Okay. 
Chris was elated to share the U of Michigan 2010 theme, What Makes Life Worth Living. Embodying positive relationships, other people matter, and justice, Chris told the story of two Korean Taekwondo competitors in the 2008 trials. The better of the two had hurt her leg and subsequently lost the competition and her chance to go to the Olympics. The winning competitor felt this was unfair and gave her her slot to the injured one. When asked, how could you throw away your dream, the woman replied, I didn't. I gave it to a friend. Uh, his reflection number 88 is about Jan's comment. It's called, Days Are Long, Life Is Short. I hope that no one thinks that a writer of reflections about the good life, i.e. me, has it all together. <laughs> and I do want to say something about that. Um, in, in an essay to, uh, called what every, girl, what Every Girl Should Know, I think, Robertson Davies in a commencement address to the girls' school across the way from the boys' school that he attended in Canada as a young boy, asked the girls, as you come up to accept your diploma, what is the word in your heart? Is it yes or is it no? Now, Chris was a depressive and a pessimist. I mean, he didn't have it together, but his word in the heart was yes. Competitive soul that I am, I bet I could trounce most of you who read what I write on formal measures of neuroticism and rumination. <laughs> <laughs> As a writer, I try to convey a public persona of being somewhat evolved and somewhat wise. Believe me, it ain't so. A common inside joke among research psychologists is that we study those topics that we simply do not get. In some cases, this is obvious. Myopic psychologists seem more likely to study vision than their 2020 colleagues. Out of shape psychologists seem more likely to study physical fitness, and unmarried psychologists seem more likely to study marriage. <laughs> Following this line of reasoning, are positive psychologists less than positive? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. I could characterize the major players in positive psychology as walking the walk versus talking the talk. But they are my friends and my colleagues, happy or not, and I will respect their privacy. It's probably enough that I've just outed myself as needing further work. Sometimes people are urged to live in the moment. I think this advice needs to be qualified by understanding what the moment entails. To paraphrase Albert Ellis, if the moment in which we live is draped in oughts and shoulds, it's probably better not to live in it. Everyday life, of course, poses demands. And I am not saying we should ignore those we do not like. I am simply saying to myself, if no one else, to keep the bigger picture in mind. Things not worth doing are not worth doing obsessively. There must be an ancient Buddhist aphorism that makes my point profoundly, but I'll just say it bluntly in plain 21st century Americanese, don't sweat the small stuff. And most of it is small stuff. Days are long, life is short, live it well. Um, so I want to have a discussion with you before I close. Uh, it, it, Chris was, uh, uh, he taught, positive psychology, he founded it, he researched it, but most interestingly of all the major figures in positive psychology, he lived it. And, and so the question is, what would, what would be a monument to Chris? What phoenix rise out of Chris's, Chris's ashes? And I think it's the question of how we can, part of the reason I brought up what happened on the positive psychology listserv as opposed to the cognitive one was that those of you, Jan and Dan and Audre, were living positive psychology as well as your roles of uh, teaching it. And so my question is, 
how can we institutionalize living positive psychology? One of the most vibrant things for me about positive psychology as opposed to psychology is you guys. What wonderful people you are. And that, you know, I've spent uh, almost 50 years going to faculty meetings. I, I never met a faculty member I would trust my life to. Uh, <laughs> but I, th there are a good number of you I would trust my life to. So the question I want to ask you for discussion is how can we create, institutionalize this combination of teaching positive psychology, researching positive psychology, and living it? I'll frame it a bit. Uh, for 10 days now, I've been besieged with requests about monuments, memorials, scholarships, money, and the like. And I, as James knows, I've responded by saying, I just can't deal with that now, because I'm trying to mull over what Chris most, what, what would be the best memorial I know to Chris. And I think it's this question of institutionalizing living positive psychology. Lisa? Yeah, so just if you don't know about that, in uh, fall of two, 2010, the University of Michigan had the theme, I think, The Good Life from Chris, and they organized scores of events around it. Uh, I got to go to give the Tanner Lecture in that regard, and, and apparently it was very successful. And one of the things that Chris and, Nan, Chris and I planned to do was Adelaide, where I have a role in trying to uh, do things for the city in Australia. So Chris was going to come uh, in February to work with me on, on uh, doing for Adelaide what he had done for Ann Arbor. Uh, ironically, uh, Chris's, the last few years of his life, was the issue of wrestling with death itself. And as a founding member of uh, the Positive Health Steering Committee, he was leading the research on looking for uh, holding risk factors constant, those parts of positive psychology which uh, led to longer lives, better prognosis, lower morbidity. So in thinking about how to close this, uh, well, this is something I know some of you have heard before. Uh, uh, this is a poem that uh, I love and Chris loved as well, uh, The Labors of Floor. Uh, most of the alums have heard this, but I think the, the, the new students have not. Uh, this is a poem by, by David Wagoner, and it's the last two stanzas that make sense of what goes before. <coughs> Stiff as the icicles in their beards, the ice king sat in the great cold hall and stared at Thor who had lumbered this far north to stagger them with his gifts, which, back at home, seemed scarcely human. Immodesty forbids, his sidemen locally, Loki, proclaimed throughout the preliminary bragging, and reeled off Thor's accomplishments, fit for sagas, or a seat at the bench of the gods. With a sliver of beard, an ice king picked his teeth. Is he a drinker? And Loki boasted of challengers laid out as cold as pickled herring. The Ice King offered a horn cup, long as a harp's neck, full of mead. Thor braced himself for elbow and belly room and tipped the cup and drank as deep as mackerel and deeper, reaching down for the halibut till his broad belt buckled. He had quaffed one inch. Maybe he's better at something else, yawned an ice king. Remembering the boulders he'd seen Thor heave and toss in the pitch of anger, Loki proposed a bout of lifting weights. You men have been humping rocks from here to there for ages, an ice king said. They cut no ice. Lift something harder. And he whistled out a gray-green cat with cold, mouse-holy eyes. Thor gave it a pat, then thrust both heavy hands under it, stooped, 
and heisted, heisted again, turned red in the face and bit his lip and heisted from the bottom of his heart and lifted one limp forepaw. Now, pink in the face himself, Loki said quickly that heroes can have bad days like bards and beggars, but Thor of all mortals was the grossest wrestler and would stake his demigodhood on one fall. Seeming too bored to bother, an ice king waved his chilly fingers around the meat hall saying, does anyone need some trifling exercise before we go glacier calving in the morning? An old crone hobbled in, foul-faced and gamey, as bent in the back as any bitch of burden, as gray as water, as feeble as an oyster. An ice king said, she's thrown some boys in her time. Uh, Thor would have left, insulted, but Loki whispered, when the word gets south, she'll be at least an ogress. Thor reached out sullenly and grabbed her elbow, but she quicksilvered him and grimmed her gums. Thor tried his patented hammerlock takedown, but she melted away like steam from a leaky sauna. He tried a whole Nelson, shrank to half, to a quarter, then nothing. He stood there panting at the ceiling. Who got me into this demigodiness? As flashy as lightning, the woman belted him with her bony fist and boomed him to one knee, but fell to a knee herself, as pale as moonlight. Bawling for shame, Thor left by the back door, refusing to be consoled by Loki's plans for a quick revision of the orthodox version of the evening's deed, including Thor's translation from vulnerable flesh and sinew into a dish fit for the gods and a full apotheosis with catches and special effects by the sharpest gleeman available in an otherwise flat season. He went back south casting his bitter lesson moment by moment for the rest of his life, believing himself a pushover, faking greatness along a tawdry strain of misadventures. Meanwhile, the ice kings trembled in their chairs but not from the cold. They had seen a man hoist high the great horn cup that ends deep in the ocean and lower all seven seas by his own stature. They'd seen him budge the cat of the world and heft the pillar of one paw. The whole north corner. They'd seen a mere man wrestle with death herself and match her knee for knee, grunting like thunder. <laughs> 